take as much time and it arrives safely. So yeah, let's go. I'm excited about this one. Let's get the episode started. Cheers, guys. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Technician Podcast. Today, I've got my man Lachlan Mitchell with me. How are you, bro? Mate, I'm living the dream. Living the dream. Very much so, man. Guys, just for reference, I walked in here today and I was blown away by this place. We're on the water in the Gold Coast. Not only that, but I think the biggest aspect, dude, is the people you're living here with. Mm. They're epic. Mm. <laughs> and do we not talk about how important environment is for our growth and just how we are? And I can see if I lived here, if anyone lived here, they're going to be good because you got people around you that just want the best for you and they're just beautiful humans with good energy. Like, mm. how do you feel now that you live here compared to where you used to before this? So, oh, it's amazing. It's like you're around people that are just pushing you to drive. You know, you're the sum of the six people you hang around. You know, it's the law of conformity. You know, if you're going to be around nine recreational drug users, there's a fairly good chance you'll be the tenth. So, you know, if you're around people that are pushing in business, that are helping people, that are making money, then you're going to be that other person that's also going to be making money and living the dream you want to live. Agreed. Even just looking at your guys' vision boards and stuff around the place and, you know, that's something that's so important to be able to physically see what you want, right? Mm. Uh, we talk about manifestation. We talk about books like The Secret and all these things and it's like, yeah, cool. Energetically, you can have whatever you want, but you must also do the things to get to that point, right? Mm. So um, do you find that when you've got someone to keep you accountable, that's a huge thing too, even though I would assume you keep yourself pretty accountable? Yeah, I do. Um, but it's also being being able to be called out on your shit, and especially in this household when I've got, I'm around four other people that have done deep, uh, deep work on themselves. They see the bullshit coming a mile away, you know, and we'll sit down for a house meeting and, and we'll call each other all out and then we'll finish it up with love because we're all just trying to help each other and a place of no ego. So how good's that? It's, it's pretty phenomenal because it's like if something comes up, we just say it and we're all aware enough to be, not to ever take it to heart and like why would we take it to heart in the first place well when you let things fester right that's when they build up to this diseased wound that's weeping with pus and blood and all this other shit and it's like well you could have just come over here and cleaned my wound up a little bit with a few harsh words and we you know call each other out like you said mm. we're good to go we're healthy we're happy and i feel like is it also a house full is it is it all women besides no, yourself one, one other guy one other guy Three okay women, one guy. and he's similar he's done nlp and all the other yeah. stuff as well yeah yeah, dude, see that that in itself. You know, I've, I've got mates that are incredible humans, right? I've known guys since I was, you know, 10, 11 years old. A lot of old football mates. Mm. And the difference being, obviously, yeah, we'll, we'll take the piss out of each other and stuff and call each other on our stuff, but it's not actual, like, constructive, like, let's help each other grow kind of feedback. It's more of a derogatory, like, you're a oh, you're fat mess, like, those sort of yeah. things. It's like... Whereas if you could have this like really healthy conversation around like, dude, the way you've been treating women mm. isn't good enough. Mm. You know, you need to pull your act out. You need to do this, this and this. This is why you get toxic girlfriends. This is why this, this and this. All of a sudden, this, you know, thing that they continue to do changes because someone called them on their blind spot because they might not even be aware of the shit they do too, right? Yeah. Would you say that's a big thing as well? Oh, absolutely. I think until you get called out, it's like when you think about anything that triggers you, like in those, like in that space, and yeah, I guess in that footy space, if someone does come along and does call you out, I feel as though a generalization is a lot of guys will be like, "What the fuck? Like, mm. what? What do you mean?" And it just must mean that they're so far, it's so far out of their awareness that it could trigger them. It's like I'm not like that. What do you mean? What do you mean I'm doing that? And um, creating just broadening that perspective. Because, you know, we can see one one event from, you know, a hundred different perspectives. And it's just a matter of having the people around us that can say, hey, that's probably not ideal, mate. Mm. And I'm sure people listening to you speak right now, they're like, man, who is this Who is this dude? What's he done? Like, <laughs> let's get into it. So we will take it back as we normally do. We'll take it back to childhood to however far back you remember, bro. And we'll start there and sort of, I love going on a few tangents depending on what you say and we i'm sure we're going to do plenty of those yep. but because obviously leading up to what we're both doing now in this rewire your shadow program which is exciting mm. but um yeah dude let's touch on uh, little Lockie. little Lockie. um so 
I grew up with two parents that worked incredibly hard, so they ran gymnastics clubs. So I was that little kid that was running around in a nappy while all the older girls were training and um, was in the gym from a really young age. So gymnastics was a really big part of my life. Um, Had a little brother. And yeah, I Gymnastics was a really big part of my life growing up because mum and dad were were always coaching and then I started competitive gymnastics at probably the age of six or seven. Mm. So from there I was doing like nine hours a week of training as a seven-year-old and like kind of going up to high levels, uh, getting up to, you know, 15 hours and then I started grade five and, you know, I was doing 16 hours a week. I spent um, six to nine months with a Russian coach, which, <laughs> yeah, that was... I mean, I can't, like, I'm generalising here, but I'm assuming he or she was quite tough. Yeah, he was. I learnt a lot. Um, I bet. You had, had to grow up real quick. Yeah. I, I, it's not an understatement to say most days I was probably crying. Yeah. Um, but I was really lucky to have some really good blokes at that time um, who I trained in the group with. And like I have a memory of, I hate when uh, this coach would come over and he'd spot me like swing to handstands on P bars, because he just was so aggressive about it, and it was scary sometimes. Uh, so I get one of the guys, Jordan, and say, "Oh, bro, can you please come and spot me?" And I try and get my strength done really fast so that mm. I wouldn't get yelled at. <laughs> so it, was, it was hectic. Um, so that was a really big part of my life up until I was about 16, 17. I had a number of stress fractures and my body kind of was just uh, breaking down, if you'd want to call it that. Uh, How would you deal with that, by the way? Because, you know, not to cut you off, but I'm, I'm really interested to see. I can resonate heavily with that. And I'm sure a lot of people can, being young athletes. Mm. You know, I had Merv on last week, which we talk about. You're in a sport. I'm assuming it was something that you did because it was your life, but did you aspire to be like a professional gymnast or anything like that? I think having mum and dad in the space was a key thing in regards to just that unsaid expectations, if you know what I mean. Oh, it's, yeah. It's like it doesn't, it's not ever spoken about. And so you kind of grow up with this feeling of, oh, I need to stay in gymnastics. And then all of a sudden it just becomes your identity and kind of molds who you are getting through it was pretty interesting like a little bit of bullying here and there in reflection and and at the time I just didn't realize what it was like for me Mm. um but it was it was pretty toxic I had some coaches in there that were hard you know they were hard guys it sounds like a pretty tough industry you know it's uh, as any sport is with high level stuff you know you're gonna I guess almost it's a necessity to have that hard love or tough love. Yeah. It, it builds some of the strongest characters. It builds some of the strongest athletes. But mm. at the same time, if we're not careful, that can create so many issues for us moving forward, right? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have it any other way, if I'm being yeah. honest. Like, it made me who I am. Oh, and dude, yeah. Like Look at you now. You're only, what, 20, 21? 20. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, a big part of making me who I am. And when you're training 20 plus hours a week, your life is that sport, and as you probably know, um, with footy, it it gets pretty overwhelming, especially in school. Um, like you'd have a lot of the guys that they'd be in footy season, and they'd have like maybe their three or four sessions a week, and then the rowers they'd have their you know three morning sessions a week where they're up at four thirty, and they do that for about a term and a half at school. I was just I was all year round. I just I didn't <sighs> stop, yeah. which kind of led to that body just breaking down not recovering properly and so it was full on what school was this at by the way uh is it gregory terrace is that this way yeah down in brisbane yeah gotcha brisbane great school great school do you feel that you watched that environment in itself and the issues that were within that sort of stuff you know because obviously school can mold us as a human so detrimentally sometimes did you find that that certain school in itself was quite good with handling kids with like issues with the bullying, with the depression, with whatever it may have been at the time? Do you feel like a lot of that stuff was handled quite well? I think for a lot of the GPS schools and a lot of like, I went to an all boys private school. Um, it was interesting because I kind of was at school uh, in a time where there was a lot of change occurring and it was my first few years where kind of that older, like a, a lot of more rowdiness, a lot more 
boys will be boys type stuff and then the change kind of came in um, which was great to see and there were a lot more heart there they were on point around all of that stuff um, so I'd say they, they did handle it pretty well but you know there's always a few people that it isn't handled very well um, and there's you know it's it's the you know standard deviation is that you've always got people on either end of that scale who 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 are the outliers um and and people do slip through the cracks unfortunately of course it's just like anything right you know there's as a generalization there's going to be organizations whatever that it's going to be mostly good but there's going to be a few bad ones a few bad eggs that ruin it for everyone um you seem to have come through the schooling system okay though which is good uh but would you say that your time at school and doing the gymnastics and everything do you find that that was a good time in your life or something that you'd like to forget Again, I wouldn't change my past experience because it's like I'm the man I am today because of that. And like I c- we can't change the past. No. We can't change it. We can dream and we can hope. But it's like, well, what's, for what purpose will we choose to make the past different if we can't, you know, if that's not going to change where we are right now? But what we can choose is to look at how we let it define us. And so for me, I'm like, I never quite fit in anywhere because I was always a little bit of that weird kid etc um, and like I still had heaps of great mates and whatnot and there were times where it was hard um, of course um, but I wouldn't change it for the world because I wouldn't be where I am now. I love that because I believe personally what changed me in the last 12 months was writing a letter to the 17 year old self mm. that made the decision not to play for the Broncos. Mm. And I said it clear as day. I was like, thank you, brother, because what you, you sent me on a path of destruction, mm. but I wouldn't be the helper and healer that I am today if you hadn't made that decision. Mm. So this is a great topic we could speak on for a sec because I find that a lot of people are so hell-bent on holding on to the shit that happened and then allowing that to make them the person they, am to, they are today. So yep. victimhood. Yep. You know, their whole life's pur- purpose is because of this thing happened when they were 12, 13, 14, whenever. Yeah. Why do you think it is that people hold on to that stuff, you know, and how can they let it go? So I bring it back to these fundamental human needs and Tony Robbins talks about it really well. Um, So you've got certainty, uncertainty, slash variety, significance and love and connection. And it's kind of like an abstract of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. Is that like shelter and food and that sort of thing? Yeah, so Maslow's kind of bottom one, shelter, food, etc. Next one up, kind of friends, family, you know, meaning, purpose, etc. Mm. But Tony just has a, a different kind of look on it at a very fundamental level. So in regards to your question around why people are holding on to it, well, it comes back to this idea of certainty in life, you know, certainty around the things you can have, so money, food on the table, etc., the, the feelings that you'd like to feel. Then the uncertainty or variety of having a little bit of chaos, you know, having a little bit of that fun. But then these two lead into this significance and this love and connection. Now, if you grew up in a space where something did happen when you were younger, um, a part of how you form your love and connection in life often is stems from from that event. You know, like... Um, our perception of love is formed from the love that we did or we didn't receive from the people we most wanted it from. Mm. So when we get daddy issues and mummy issues. Yeah, as an abstract, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like if you're a 12-year-old kid that's growing up that's had something happen and that you're struggling and that you get significance by having this problem because you've got friends that are there for you and care for you and support for you, uh, what would happen if you lost the depression? What, if, what, ha- what would happen if you woke up tomorrow and you didn't have anxiety and you didn't have depression? What would that mean for your life? And I've asked this question to a number of people and they go, oh, it's not possible. I'm like, just play with it. Hypothetically, what would happen if you woke up and your problems were gone? And we break it down and they kind of go, oh, I'm like, would your friends still be there? Because I've, you know, knew somebody that has like, had three different accountability groups for him and had all this significance, and had all this love and connection, had all this certainty around praise and validation, all these human needs. So at an unconscious level, could this person associate not having their problems 
with also not having friends because there was a point where all of a sudden the problems became worse and all of a sudden more friends came in and that felt good. And it's like this reward and pleasure. I mean, reward and, and pain. Because at the, at, the, at the end of the day, we're all motivated by either pain or pleasure. It, it questions a lot of people's... Um, Model of the world. Yeah. It's, I, I remember um, Morgs brought it up in a podcast we did. Mm. He, he, it was the first time I'd heard this. You know, the whole like, what if it wasn't a thing? What if you didn't have anxiety? What if you didn't? And I was like... Oh, you know, that's a, you know, it's, it's a lot to say. You know, people in the community are going to be like, I get it now. I get it. I do get it because it's like, it's an emotion, right? It's something that, you know, even anxiety itself, it's actually something that's built into us to keep us protected and alive. And yet somehow yeah. we've gotten to a point where GPs are saying you have an anxiety disorder. Well, you think about human evolution and how far we've come in 150 years. It's like... 50 years ago, we didn't have social media. We didn't have all these other elements that are adding to this mental health crisis. The food we were eating 50 years ago was completely different. Mm. You know, so we've got all these biological, environmental, um, and physiological factors that are coming into play that aren't being as heavily looked at. And so... Like foundationally, there's so many things we could do to help that. Mm. And even that thing I posted in the coaching group the other day, which about dopamine... Mm. Dopamine has become one of the most dangerous drugs in the world. Absolutely. You know, and they know that. And when I say they, you can make your observations <laughs> on who they may be. Yep. But, um, you know, they've created this lifestyle for us too. That we, have don't, we don't have a chance to become conscious of things. Mm. You're very lucky these days if you can be conscious of the world and do the awakening, you know, step out of the matrix, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, because a lot of people are just so fundamentally in that phase of fear and scared and, mm. you know, the sympathetic state, they don't have a chance to even think. Mm. All they're doing is automatically going through life, mm. which you would know as the subconscious p controlling us, right? Yeah, well, it's just what we've been told. Like, mm. it's like, get the job, go to uni, go do these things, live this way. Get a missus, have kids. Get a missus, have kids, do what you got to do. But, like, what, what else is there? And we wonder how the mental health comes up and these different problems you know this lack of meaning this lack of purpose it's like well depression in the word is a state of depression when your body is not is not functioning correctly right and depression is really just a number of unprocessed emotions you know anger sadness fear hurt guilt shame all these different things coming into this one big bundle and it's like well what's What's driving this? You know, what, what, what if we take it apart and we start to deconstruct it? What's the anger you've been holding on to? What's the sadness? What's the fear? Fear's a really big one. What's the hurt? What's the guilt? What's this shame? They all come into play into this, this ball of, of shit. And it's this shit that defines our life because we never learn how to actually deconstruct and understand our emotions. Because if we did, would we be where we are right now? <laughs> <laughs> It's it's an interesting concept because you look at what we've created, and this is a great time to talk about this. Actually, um, it's something. It's a reason why I started my podcast is around mental health, spe yeah. specifically men's mental health. Yeah. You know, we're both very passionate about helping men. Obviously, women too, because um, yeah. we love everyone. But we know that men in themselves are struggling so much because they're the ones that won't talk about their shit. Now, there's so many organisations that are trying to help men's mental health. So why is it still so fucking bad? it's because the real problems aren't there is there isn't a solution for the actual problems yeah right, we've got all these mental health hotlines which is for people that are, are at the edge yeah you know and there are more things coming into play now with different programs at school around education but there aren't the right resources available to actually help men let go of their past trauma right and there are beginning to be more especially on the Gold Coast. Um, you know, if places like Brotherhood, um, Kato and Guy, they run Brotherhood Gold Coast. Men's um, Medicine. Men's Medicine. Jacob O'Neill's a really great guy I love. Uh, he does a lot of great stuff around uh, expressing rage, you know. That's um, cool. I've seen, um, is it Ke Keenan or Keegan? Odell's partner? Mm -hmm. I think his last name's Bizell. But he posted a video and he had a big 
fucking stick in oh, the yeah. water and was just smashing and screaming. And I was like, yeah. yes, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. Because I'm sure as much as work he's done, you know, he's probably very integrated. He's done a lot of work, but mm. he's still going to have tough weeks at work. Absolutely. As a coach or whatever, frustrations, et cetera. And seeing him just release it so naturally and comfortably and putting it on social media where mm. people are going to judge. Mm. Just that's awesome. Well, it's bringing, the, bringing people back into a state of equilibrium. You know, Tyron... Tyron Mowbray is another great guy that's in this space that works with men and their masculinity. Corey Boutwell is another guy that works on meaning and purpose. Um, Mankind Project Australia. So they have men's circles all around Australia. You know, that's cool. Five dollars a night, five dollars every Tuesday night, or depending where you are, and you actually get to process this. And one of the crazy things about men's circles, right? If there are good practitioners. Uh, facilitators in the room like I've seen guys drug addiction uh, all these different compulsive uh, I guess disorders etc like a lifetime of of trauma I guess um, come into the room and like their life can change in a night because all of a sudden they sit there and they just listen but they realize that hold on I'm not the only one feeling this. There are other men that feel emotion. And simply by just sitting there and, and watching another man say, I'm feeling really sad at the moment. And then if another man actually opens up and cries, it, it, it unlocks that part of them which has been repressed, which they've repressed. And like this is all around Australia. right? There are a lot of things all around Australia. We just need more people speaking up about it. Uh, Hugh Van Kylenberg, The Resilience Project, mm. he's, he's taken a really great step within schools and his whole thing is building happiness through gratitude, empathy and mindfulness and actually speaking about his journey is huge. I actually think his books would probably be one of the best self-development books I've ever read simply, simply because he opens up and is real and raw. Can you tell people what that book is, by the way? Yeah, so The Resilience Project by Hugh Van Kylenberg mm -hmm. um, just talks about his journey um, in talking in schools all around Australia, in work sites, in the mines, to uh, like Australian cricket team, to uh, worked closely with the Storm, I believe. Mm. Um, yeah, I'd love to meet him one day. <laughs> you will, bro, you will. Um, and then his next book is letting, is letting Go of Shame, Expectation and Our Addiction to Social Media. And it's just like real, real applic um, applicable things to actually help people. And it's like you've got all these other self-help books that are great and they're like there's the more the hypothetical, theoretical aspect of it, which is like do this. But at the end of the day, we're all driven by emotion, you know, our day is made up by like the five most common emotions we feel and no amount of like the four hour work week or atomic habits is going to really change those key emotions we're feeling and how those emotions were formed. You know, and the fundamental stuff. Yeah. I think that's such a key is, you know, I've gone back and read books such as think and grow rich or listen to videos from Jordan Peterson and I understand them now, but only mm. because I am integrated or I'm integrating, mm. you know, I still got so much to do. We always do. Um, I'm still peeling back massive amounts of layers each day, which I think is so important for people and men, especially to go towards the fear yeah. now, which we'll get into eventually. But, you know, understanding that you've done all this work, I'm sure people are sitting here thinking, what has this dude done? How is he at this point of understanding and knowing at the age of 20 years old? So, where do you believe it all went right for you to understand to the point that you are here now? Is it the impact that your dad had on you or was there someone else that was the catalyst for you to be at this point? It all went right the day I was born. Hey. You know, that's just, uh, you can look at things from positive or negative and it's your choice how you perceive it. In regards to the big change, um, yeah, I think my parents were great role models. Uh, dad always had the courage to... He, like he was, you know, he was running his own business from when I was born in these gymnastics clubs. Um, you know, he didn't, he went to uni for six weeks and then decided to drop out and go do some, what he loved. And so dad always had the courage to be who he was without the fear of judgment. 
you know, from everyone else. And I think having a role model like that for me was really powerful, especially as a man in that we don't have many men which can be those good role models in Especially our Especially not these days. It's getting worse and worse too. And that's just that generational trauma, um, which is which is getting better. Things are changing now, which is really great. Um, I think as well, just having really great role models for me. Um, I had some really great role models growing up. You know, yes, some of the coaches that coached me at gym were hard asses, um, but I learned a lot from them. You know, like like every coach. Uh, when I was 15, I went on a 17-day kind of initiation program with Gregory Terrace um, where we spent 17 days out in the bush. And over the span of the 17 days, we wrote a philosophy about life, reflecting on our self-image, reflecting on our communities, reflecting on who we are uh, as young men. That's huge, bro. How did that affect you doing that? Was that tough? That it was well, it's like you know, first day, first time I'd been away from family for that long. Um, first time really like being able to be a, I guess a man. Yeah. Like yes, we're still like under supervision from whatnot, but we're just we're kids having fun. Um, and then again, great mentors uh, from out there, which is you know one of the guys, Leon Cossa. He, you know, I've been on um, one of his. Uh, containers which it was like a three-month container where we did poetry and storytelling each week which was amazing like actually learning these ancient stories about life and then every month on the full moon this is going to sound a bit weird for anybody that's listening uh we'd go out and we'd fast for 24 hours and we'd we'd do a, a moon sit where we'd camp out underneath the stars and we'd fast and we'd just sit there and it was that for three months on the full moon we'd go out and we'd spend time alone. That's huge. And it's that reset. And it, it, it's, it's like a mini version of a... Um, Vipassana? Uh, uh, not a Vipassana. I'm just mind blanking on the word. A shadow quest. Gotcha. A vision quest, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. So I vision. spoke to Elodie uh, a couple of weeks ago. She went on a spirit quest. Oh, nice. Four days. Yeah. Four days. No fast. Uh, all fasting by yourself. And it's like the deepest aspects of just being alone and sitting with who you are which is so powerful. No one can do that these days, bro. Oh. No one. And they, they don't realize how powerful it could be mm. if they just spend time by themselves. Oh, it's, I, um, I loved uh, uh, Aubrey Marcus's one. He did the, oh, the, the seven, light fast. Yeah, that holy crap. I haven't listened to his podcast about it yet, oh. but I'm assuming it was one of the most profound experiences ever. He said it was, it was probably just as full on and is, as his DMT ketamine experience <laughs> um <laughs> it was just the absence of light and how that brought up all this amazing enlightening deep inner yeah and just for anyone listening Aubrey Marx has done a lot of deep work before he'd done any sort of plant medicine and that's something I really want to make clear to anybody listening who wants to do plant medicine is do the deep work first right and make sense of it and make the unconscious conscious because there are people that will have all this emotion come up and not be able to process it and they can end up in a state of dissociation for, for months at a time. Now, just to harp on that part just there, this will be great. So what I'm wanting to do moving forward with my podcast especially is there's moments where I need to sit myself in my listener's seat. Mm. and pretend I'm the listener. Mm. Now, any average listener, I'm just going to assume they might not know what you just said. So, where do they begin on doing the deep work? <sighs> it's a great rewire question. Rewire your shadow. <laughs> yeah, rewire your shadow, <laughs> jump on. Um, find, find people who exemplify the individual you'd like to be. Right? It's, it's modelling. We as humans, we learn behaviour from a young age through modelling. So, you know, find a men's circle, find a women's circle, find a place in which you're going to be taken out of your comfort zone because every time you leave your comfort zone, you learn something about yourself. Test your edge, right? You test your edge. Well, to nourish the center, you need to visit the edges, right? Find, like, dive into the, the idea of what the shadow is. Dive into repressed emotion. It's like literally just asking yourself, and you can do this right now as you're listening to my voice, is what what anger are you currently holding on to? Who are you 
holding anger on to? You know, where are you still holding this emotion inside your body? Because you are. <laughs> Everyone does. It's just a matter of making it aware so that you can choose whether or not you let it def- define you or define your day or define your life, etc. And even just touching to, to really make sure people do that, let's talk about what anger can do to your body if mm. you suppress that shit. Because mm. I know I've had it before mm. and it was the sickest I've ever been in my life. Mm. You know, we talk about your Joe Dispenza's and stuff with the like creating dis-ease in the body through emotions and what it can do with diseases. Mm. You know, creating sickness within our body literally through emotions, guys. So understand that if you're holding on to Johnny who was 16 that hooked up with your missus at the time or whatever and you're still holding on to that and you're now creating your life around how you perceive women because of that, Mm. it's ruining your life in so many different ways. Mm. Not just the feeling of that you can't trust women or men in that self, but you can't trust yourself. And holding on to that anger, you're going to create, well, I can't say you're going to. This can create Mm. issues within your body. Would you say that that's pretty spot on? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a naturopath. I'm not any of these people, right? Like this is through my experience. experience in being in places and rooms and working with clients one-on-one where their chronic pain has disappeared after they've done releases. Uh, I've seen a woman uh, who's, she went off, uh, she dramatically reduced her insulin for her diabetes. Uh, There's a great book by Inna Siegel, who uh, a friend of mine just went on a podcast or did an interview with her and she wrote... um, uh, the magic of the body or something like that. We'll find the link and put it mm. in. But it basically looks at, well, what does each injury or what does each kind of autoimmune disease uh, mean for you? And speaking about autoimmune is a really key one. Uh, and Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson, so Jordan Peterson's daughter, they've gone on the, the carnivore diet and cleared up all their autoimmune symptoms. She had like... Rheumatoid arthritis or something, Rheumatoid didn't she? Like real she had bad. So much. Uh, her depression went away, all from just eating meat. <laughs> now that was a bit of a side track around from holding uh, emotions in the body, um, but it all goes to show, like from that space of bringing your body back into equilibrium. About what food are you putting in your body? Is it that their mic- their gut microbiome adjusted to the food they were eating? And their body was able to start processing things better and start processing emotions better and to to start living in a space of uh, peace, right? Or homeostasis. homeostasis, that parasympathetic state. You know, I would say that these days compared to back in the day when I was playing football, right now I could say I confidently sit in um, parasympathetic state 95% of the time. Yeah. I'm very calm. I'm not nervous about anything. Yeah. I couldn't give a fuck. So if you go back to 16, 17 year old Trav mm. leading up to football games, I'm freaking out, dude. My body is, yeah. I'm pooping like six days, six <laughs> times a day. I'm just an absolute wreck. And then I'm always sick. I'm always injured, mm. obviously, because mm. my body was never in the, the proper state to even be foundationally healthy. I had no chance because I was constantly anxious, constantly depressed, constantly mm. all these things. But the foundation of it all, right, <laughs> we come back to the emotions, we come back to the sub- subconscious and how it's programmed. And I know for a fact, I love my dad. Mm. I love my mom. They're incredible people. But I know that a lot of the things I picked up at a very young age were unfortunately from the way that they spoke and the way they acted. And, you know, they were only doing what they could at the time. Yeah. I had an incredible upbringing. Um, you know, so did my brothers and sister. But I just know that some of the beliefs that I took on, potentially from them and the people around me in my environment, created the disease in my body and my mind that then potentially caused a lot of the injuries, a lot of the making up shit excuses not to go to training, all these things yeah. on a foundational level. Yeah. And I, and But the thing is, we talk, we go back to before, I'm, I would never sit here and blame anyone for that. Yeah. You know, I, I get to, if there's one thing we have control over, which is a lot, I think a lot of people don't realize, but I get to respond to that however I want. Mm. I could sit here and be like, oh, fucking mum and dad, this, this, this is why I'm here. Like, no, it is not their fault at all. I had a decision to respond to my upbringing or whatever, my, my environment, however I wanted. Yeah. yeah, it could have been a little bit harder because I didn't know what I was doing at the time. But we always have a choice, right? So why is it that so many people 
choose not to respond. They choose to say that I didn't have it. I, I can't control that. I can't do this. I can't do that. I think the majority of the population are just brought up, brought up in a way in which like everything's learned behavior, mm. right? Like we learned from our parents generally how to respond to certain social situations. And we look at uh, like the social psychology of how different people interact. Um, I don't think it's that people can't. I just think that we don't necessarily learn how to in the first place. And it's not until we find those good mentors and those good role models that we go, oh, I can respond in a different way. I can look at this differently, right? So I think that's a really key piece is is seeing how other people act. Um, mm. I think that's a big one. I think... I heard it a few weeks ago. It was those we admire, we acquire. Mm. So I know my life changed when I started the podcast mm. because look what happened. I said it before to the guys in your house as well. I was like, what was so good about it? I've been able to become friends with people maybe I would never have had a chance to chat to beforehand. Yeah. So, you know, now I've got one of my best mates, Todd Jarrett. You know, he's an incredible subconscious coach. Mm. Clearly, he calls me out shit all the time. <laughs> These blind spots I don't see or ask me these certain questions to take it deeper. But the big change is that I'm okay with people saying those things to me. Mm. It doesn't matter who you are. You can tell me, hey, Trav, I've noticed that you're doing this, this, and this. I'm like, oh, awesome. Thanks for calling me out. Yeah. As I said before the episode as well, there is a few people that just call you out for no reason because they're projecting their own shit. Yeah. But, um, but that's okay. Yeah. Because I understand I've got no – I have the decision whether it bothers me or not. Right, so how do we get to that point? Because I feel like already at 20 years old, you are 12 years ahead of me where I'm at now, which is okay. I'm cool with that. But I'm sure there's people listening that might be in their 40s, might be in their 50s, mm. that are thinking like, how did you do this? What do you think, as much as you had great mentors and everything, do you feel like NLP in itself was a huge aspect to get you to this point as well? Oh, absolutely. Uh, like some of the most integrated individuals I've ever met in my life um you know now Elizabeth Ann Walker is incredible like I, I I back her with everything she does because of the impact it makes on this world she's clearly good at what she does because she gets so much hate obviously and people sh people get triggered yep. by her right she's incredible right but she's making an impact to people's lives you know and creating a, a movement you know and she's got an incredibly powerful story as well. I recommend people go and go and make their own assumptions before they make judgments, because we only make assumptions from what from the information we what know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I I love when people, you know, say you know it's a it's a cult or it's a <laughs> it's manipulative, and I'm like, well, who have you heard that from? What's your sources of information? What would happen if you just went and went to go and watch? And, and make your own assumptions first. In fact, what if we all just didn't make assumptions and we waited till we had all the information to make a decision? I dare say we would live in a better world, right? <laughs> Dude, go watch the movie and see if it's good for yourself oh before someone... God. You go on IMDB and see all these shit reviews, like, I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in general, yeah, it's being around really integrated individuals that have a deep understanding of human behaviour and how it is that we create the world we live in. You know, how is it that we are the person we are because of our past, right? And, yeah, I've, in regards to, to getting to the point, I guess, of acceptance it is, it is acknowledging, you know, half of solving a problem is actually writing down clearly what the problem is. You're halfway to solving it. And so if you can actually take a step and reflect on your life and say, what are my fears? You know, what, what are the things that I want and for what purpose am I not getting them, right? And there's a thing from, uh, from uh, Existential Kink by Caroline Elliott, which is a deepest fear inventory. Actually write down what you're afraid of because a part of there's a thing in the brain called the, re called the reticular activating system, right? And the reticular activating system um, creates a lens on the reality that we see. You know, it's like from a from an evolutionary perspective, it was you know we need to avoid the we need to avoid predators, we need to get food, we need to have this, and so we're constantly we're wired for that. 
But in the same way, if all of a sudden, you know, we're trying to avoid um, judgment, we're trying to avoid failing, we're trying to avoid all this fear, at what point does the avoiding become actually what we're focusing on? And if we're focusing on all this fear, how is then that becoming the reality we're creating? That's huge, dude. And so it's deconstructing the way that we associate emotions to a stimulus, right? It's like I'm going to walk into a room and there'll be people there. Some people might go, oh my God, people are going to judge me. It's really scary. And their body has that physiological nervous system reaction. But actually there was a point in your life where you decided that you needed to be nervous. You know, that's just the body going into flight or fight and, and being worried, flight, fight, freeze. But when was that created? When was this response of this anxiety created? When didn't you have it? Because there was a time in your life where you didn't have it. So what would happen if we were to go back and make sense of all this emotion that you're associating to these certain events, associating to relationships, associating to asking for a bigger pay rise at work, associating to making more money, to doing the things you want to do? Because we just associate all these emotions to it. And then we make it hard in our heads because we tell ourselves a story. Mm, it's, uh, I, I'd love to tell anyone listening what happened for me recently, obviously since working with Lockie, is that I've been questioned many times now by a few people, especially mates and mentors. And it's like, dude, how are you not killing it yet? Now this is in regards to money because they see what I'm doing. But I see what I'm doing. I question myself and Lockie asked me something. He's like, what have you attached to success? That's a negative. Something around that. And um, mm. I had attached to me being more successful and making more money. I'd have less time. Mm. It's freedom. Which makes no sense. And freedom is obviously my top values. Like it's everything for me. Yeah. And I just, it took me back to a moment where, to be honest, right now, as I speak about it, it takes me back to the moment I had the decision, right? I had the decision to be a Broncos player. Mm. So my fear of how successful I could be took over. Mm. So right now I'm in that same situation. Mm. I'm at the precipice of we could have one of the biggest programs going. Mm. It could be, it will be yeah. life-changing. I know that. Mm. And yet something on a deep level keeps trying to pull me back. I'm working through it Mm. because of your help and other people's help and what I understand. But I can just feel it. It's like, no, I remember this feeling. You're not supposed to be successful. You're not supposed to make millions of dollars. Yeah, It's coming up from somewhere. How old were you when you went to sign with the Broncos? 17. So what did that 17-year-old think he was going to lose at that time? What was his safety zone? Friends and family. Friends and family. I was moving to Brisbane Mm. from from Woodford. Mm. And so the little boy inside of you, what was that little boy, what was he actually afraid of? Um, I guess I'm losing the people I love. (sighs) Yeah, that makes more sense. This is just an example, guys, of like just actually feeling that emotion can can bring up the emotion, um, and how our little how our inner child is so present on a day to day, you know. And this is what we call a conflict. Mm. Right? You know, Trav could have done whatever he wanted to do, but really, the the little boy was just scared of losing, you know, his mum and dad, losing his family. And it's amazing that he got to experience that because it's made him the man he is today. You know, how many people you've helped, mate? Yeah, it's cool, dude. Like, I, I love the life I live right now and I'm, I'm grateful for the um, decision I made because, as I said, I've written that note and mm. read it back and when I read it back is when it hit me. Mm. You know, you speak it and the subconscious hears it and it's like, oh, I remember this shit. Because time is not a thing, right? Subconscious doesn't know any of that. Mm. It just understands that feeling when those words are said and felt. Mm. 
And um, just then, yeah, that I've never been asked that, and I've never thought of it that way. I thought it was time, mm. but you think about it, and it's like a small country town kid who's terrified of everything, mm. nervous, anxious, shy, awkward, moving to a new city mm. with these other men, mm. boys that are, I would perceive as better than me. I was just as good as them. Yeah, all those things foundationally, and then the biggest one was yeah, losing that support network that you know, may have potentially caused a few of the issues. But that's okay. But they also supported me like crazy through it. Mm. So imagine losing that safety network that was saving me from potentially killing myself, mm. from potentially doing some really bad things. And like that event wasn't actually the event. It was something that probably happened because there was a point where you decided that you were afraid of losing your family. Yeah. And that was probably when you were really little. Yeah. In those first seven years. That seven years, yeah. Yeah, and I'd I'd have to have a chat to them and just ask if there was anything, you know, whether they, and they're, they're, they're not the type of people to talk about these things, but it'd be great to get into it. I'm sure anyone, if you could have this conversation with you, your friends, your family, um, especially your parents from zero to seven, if it's our subconscious is, you know, designed during that time, if they were really struggling during that and fighting a lot or whatever, who knows how that affected me. Yeah. And a, the unconscious mind, like we've got prime directives of the unconscious mind, right? And this isn't a, this is an NLP model of the world. Um, and, and I guess a general psychological based theory that uh, we will repress emotions in order to protect ourselves. Mm. Um, and those emotions can come up and those memories can come up in, in, in order for them to be resolved. So that I know there are a couple of guys, it's like, I just don't remember my childhood. I'm like, well, your unconscious mind's just trying to protect Protecting you. Protecting you, yeah. Right, and they, they do come up. You know, states of hypnosis, uh, when you feel safe and comfortable and your, your nervous system actually is calm and, and can be held. And I know definitely in states of relationships, when you're with someone that you so deeply trust and you're being led through a process those walls can drop, you know, because we all put up those metal doors, those brick walls in order to protect ourselves because we think that something will go wrong. But we only decided that when we were seven years old and something happened. So we shut off all our emotion. We shut off wanting to feel. But that was just the seven-year-old boy. That was the inner child. And that little boy then continues living on within us, that little boy and that little girl. And all of a sudden, we get to our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s. It's like, well, why am I making the decisions I'm making? What's the unconscious drive behind that? And this is why this work is so important. Oh, dude, I've got goosebumps. Like, I, I'm so excited to bring this mm. to people, not just because it's our thing. Mm. People have done this work for years. Mm. You know, Carl Jung put the word shadow an inner child to the psychology name and brought it to the mm -hmm. Western world. But shamans and stuff have been doing it for thousands of years. Yeah. But we can create this in the Gold Coast, Sunny Coast, Brisbane, et cetera, yeah. and make it even more popular because when we do, we're creating the change that needs to happen or gets to happen, right? It's helping people out of a depressive state, an anxious state, all these horrible things that are happening. Mm through doing some stuff that might be seen as a little bit weird, but I think weird's the new cool. Well, it's just out of your current model of the world and that will change. People just don't understand it, yeah. Like I wouldn't have seen, I had no idea about this stuff 12 months ago. The change that's happened to me in 12 months, mm. and this is what I put to anyone listening. How about this? How about you don't suffer for the next 12, 15 years like I did to understand where you can be? Mm. How about Lockie and I spend eight weeks with you and we dive into all your shit and you come out the other side feeling better, healthier, happier, probably on purpose. Exactly where we're both at now. But, you know, Lockie obviously didn't take the time that I did. But, yeah, I've spent since I was 17 years year old till 32 years old now, specifically the last 12 months, I've gone hard at yeah. self-development, integrating, facing all my shit, mm. calling out severe issues that I've dealt with in the last 12 months, relationship breakups, all this stuff. And 
this is what I put to you guys. Like, can we not help? I would love to be able to help you guys get to where we are now so you don't have to suffer for years or months or whatever. Mm. You can get through that in eight weeks, get you on the track. And the question for you guys listening is, what are you going to make more important than your own self self growth and living the life you want to live? And I'm going to tell you right now, what you'll make more important is the fear. It's the fear of failing. It's the fear of not being good enough. It's the fear of not being worthy. Fear of change. But how is this fear going to actually create your life? It's going to stop you from asking for that pay rise. It's going to stop you from wanting to be in that beautiful relationship. It's going to stop you from having the things you want. Because what happens? Like what's going to happen in if in, if in three months' time you could be a totally different human but you made the pain of failing more important and then you choose not to do it, where are you going to be in six months' time? What's, go- what's that going to look like, sound like, and feel like? What about, what about two years if you could have done something which had made the change? And what I'm doing right now is taking you on a journey to help you make sense of where you're at and how your current actions will affect your future, right? What about five years' time if you keep allowing the same cycles to play out? the same emotions, the same limiting beliefs to manifest. What about, what about in 10 years' time? How's this going to affect your kids? How's, how's this going to affect the life you want to live? Right? And, and what I'm saying now is really harsh, and it's called putting you in the pit. But most people are more motivated by pain than they are pleasure. And so what are you going to make more important? The pain of possibly failing? Or the pain of living a life that could have been different, right? So mm. let's go back. What about in three months' time if you create a massive shift in your life, you let go of all the things that you needed to let go of? How would that feel? How much more confident would you feel? How much more stable? How much more certainty? How much more love and passion, happiness, gratitude could you have? Three months time, what about six months? You know, a year from now. What could your life look like? Feeling finding more meaning and purpose, love, connection. You know, five years, ten years. The 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 children that you could have. Right? Because at the end of the day, in my mind, life is about enjoying the passage of time. And if it costs me, you know, like I've spent 40 grand on my self-development over the past nine months, it's been worth every penny. Because I don't really want to spend another 10 years struggling through trying to figure it out by myself when I can figure it out in six months. (laughs) And obviously I'm not ever figuring it all out. We're all always learning and, and journeying. But it's these key emotions that we're just holding on to. Like they can be let go of. It's just in this case, some people are going to keep being driven by fear rather than the potential of what could be. And like our nervous systems are hardwired for comfort. But the essence of what makes us us, some would say our soul, is hardwired for growth. And it's about managing this dynamic tension between the comfort zone and the innate calling of our potential. Oof. Mm. Clip that, post that, done. <laughs> Dude, and it's... Uh, I resonate with that whole that whole thing, man. Like, mm. I'd, I sit here and I look at... I, I was so hesitant to become a coach myself, right? Mm. Because of all the negativity around it, which is crazy, bro. There's just, they're just people helping people. I get that, again, we go back to what we said at the start where there's just a few people that are shit ones that might make it worse for everyone else, right? People that are scumbags that do sell a certain way or whatever, they take advantage. There are those people. There's those type of people in everything that everyone does. Yeah. Just understand that, yeah, you could sit here and just say, oh, they're just another captive want to be Tony Robbins or whatever it may be. I've copped that before. <laughs> Myself, Todd and Rip, some dude was just going in on us on YouTube. He's like, oh, you're just a bunch of fucking young, rah, rah, rah. I was like, okay, cool. Again, projections. Mm. 
But, you know, I'm at this stage now where like, that's cool. If that's what needs to happen for me to help others that want the help, mm. that's fine. Because I know that if I lead with love and I just say to those people that do talk shit or do call us out and whatever it may be, that's cool. You know, when you're ready, I'm here to help you too. Yeah. I love you. We're all collective consciousness. Like we all, we all are one. If that's what you want to believe, that's what I believe. Yeah. Uh, so if I don't allow my projections to come out like you may do in these situations where you see a life coach come through and you say a certain thing or believe a certain thing, then that's cool. But just understand that my life has changed by not only being around these people, but also becoming one. Yeah. So, you know, if it's, and what we've just heard you say during this is mentors. Yeah. Right? Mentors, that's, that's why you were, you're at where you're at. Coaches. Coaches. Whatever you want to call it. Like we're just calling you out on your shit and helping you no longer respond to that shit in the same way. Yeah. And help you get happier a little bit quicker. Yeah. So like we just said, you don't have to suffer for the next 10, 20 years until you finally make the decision to go and do the work. Yeah. We can help you now. So I was just thinking and it just came to me. It's like, are you willing to carry the trauma of your parents for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Are you willing to pass it on to your kids? Because that's how generational trauma is created. Right. There's ancestral trauma. I had no idea about. There's things from past lives that are coming through. I know that's a lot for some people to hear. Mm. But I mean, believe what you will, but once you start to dive into this stuff, there's things that I know I'm a certain way I am because of things that have happened before this lifetime. Yeah. That my soul yeah. energy had taken on. Yeah. So, you know, for us to face these fears and to overcome these things, which I've talked about many times on my podcast, guys, is that this is what's changed me over the last 12 months. And I know I've lost mates because of that. Mm. Now, I've lost friends because they've seen me change. Mm. They've looked at me and said, probably thought, that's not Trav. Mm. Who's this person that's <laughs> doing these things yep. now? Speaking the way he speaks, yelling in dudes' faces, mm. whatever. And I get that. I do get that because that is what we are built to believe. Those things are weird. You know, and that's why we've got so many people in pain. Because mm. imagine if everyone was doing like breath work and stuff. bro. Just that on a foundational level how different the world would be. Yeah. Is it weird or is it just that you've never been able to see something from another perspective? Definitely that. You know, like, <laughs> you know, all all therapy is, right, is changing the way you see something. That's all it is. It's shifting the way that you perceive and make sense of an environment and a stimulus and the way you react. And you can be... You know, like I do, I, I say what I do is shadow work, you know, in a child work, you can be that or you can be a mate that tells you a story and that changes everything for you because you can hear a metaphor about life and that can, that can flick a switch. It can be the smallest thing. Right? I think what makes the biggest difference is how else can I see this? How can, else can I choose to perceive all of this? Uh, it's one of the biggest biggest things is perspective mm. because you could be angry at something, but like, what if I go stand over here? You know, what if I go step forwards? And this comes out something Jordan Peterson says, which I love, is that if you're feeling stuck or you've, you're in a position, right, and you can only see something from where you're currently sitting, take a step in any direction because then you won't be where you once were and you can now see it from a different light. Mm. Yeah, he said that to a student the other day that I was listening to. Mm. And he was talking about how people are so proud of who they are and they're not willing to change. Mm. That's when it becomes detrimental to their own health, their own well-being, because we should always be growing, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we're dying. Yeah. Moving forward. So, touching on that, great segue into what we do. Mm. Um, and actually... I will completely just jump the opposite way and just realize that I need to mention my, my sponsor right now. <laughs> Seeing things from a different light in itself. Uh, and Evolution Australia, Jolly Boy, Joel Andrews, all about crypto. So I actually set up a mining system in my, my house, so a little crypto mining station. It's about, oh, about 50 centimeters by 40 centimeters, guys, but essentially this thing will be massive, making you passive money. 
mm. which is really cool. But obviously the biggest thing with Joel is that he understands crypto so well. He can talk about it anytime, any day, and he'll teach you everything he needs to know. But if you guys are wanting to get into earning some sort of passive income and understand crypto a bit, because the way our world is going, the way technology is going, I feel like that's our future. Mm. Are you into it yourself? Uh, I invested in crypto when I was like 16. There you go. (laughs) So yeah, guys, if you really want to get into this and Evolution Australia, Jolie, you'll find him on Instagram or in the show notes as well. I'll chuck it in there if you want to have a chat to him and get amongst that. But uh, he's an incredible human with an incredible business. So thank you for sponsoring us, Joel. And um, we'll now segue back into what we're going to go into, which is really diving into what is this shadow work that everyone keeps seeing. They keep seeing this Mm. rewire your shadow. What Mm. the fuck is this? (laughs) So the shadow, right? The shadow is all the things, both good and bad, that we've denied about ourselves and hidden beneath the surface of the mask that we forgot that we were wearing, right? So how does these beliefs, because the shadow is just the beliefs we have about ourselves, how do these beliefs play into the life we live, right? If someone at a fundamental level doesn't believe they're good enough, then are they going to find the person in a relationship that is best for them? Are they going to ask for the pay rise? Are they going to are they going to commit to losing weight and making themselves the best version of themselves they can? I can give you an example of this of someone I saw at a men's circle who he was trying to quit smoking. Oh, right? That's and a big one. Yeah, so it's a big one. But it's like, well, what's driving this? Is it addiction? Like, is it just that there's a chemical addiction in the brain? That's a part of it. But actually, what's driving it? And so we do this thing where he stands up in the circle. Um, I just need to sneeze. Do you think? Muted. All right. (laughs) Sorry. So he stood up in the circle and and they ask him, so what was the the commitment that you made? Well, he said, like, I promised my missus that I'd quit smoking, that I'd stop. Um, and they're like, so what did you actually do? It's like, oh, I, I went and bought a pack of dairies. It's like, well, great. What did you make more important than committing? And he said something along the lines of, I like that gratification, right, of doing it. And it's like, right, what was the impact on you? What was the impact on others? Well, the impact on him was that he, he wouldn't, he'd, his girlfriend would get disappointed. And the impact on others, so his girlfriend, was that maybe she wouldn't love him as much because he'd, he'd failed it in an essence, right? And so it's like, what, what are you making? What's the story that you've been telling yourself about this specifically? About why you want to sabotage the relationship because that's what the essence of it is. And the shadow is always linked to self-sabotage. So how... Where is his self-sabotage is coming from? What's the belief he's got about himself? And so they're like, what's the feeling that you're feeling in your body in and around sabotaging your relationship? And it was like fear, right? And it just kind of went down. And what's beneath that? What's beneath that? And it's like, well, the, the, the fear of kind of being alone, the fear of, of someone leaving. Like, oh, when did you first experience this? When I was 12. And what about before that? Oh, when I was eight. What about before that, when I was five? What about before that? Oh, when I was three. What happened when you were three? My dad left. Yeah. As in he just left the family or he'd passed away? Left the family, I think. Gotcha. Um, and so what else does a little boy, a little three-year-old boy, who an important male role model in his figure left, right? What would be the belief that that little boy would hold about himself, you reckon? If he doesn't understand the situation. He was the reason that dad left. Yeah. He wasn't good enough. He wasn't worthy. You know. Now now, he, now he's alone. And so this is a really key element. Especially in this imprinting phase from zero to seven. How the events that occur. Create beliefs. That then drive the rest of our life. Right. Mm. And these are all things which come into play. Yeah. It resonates big for me in this situation and I'll, I'll tell the story purely for anyone listening to, to be very, I'm very transparent. Mm. You know, I'll always tell my stories to, to bring relevance to what we're speaking about too. So 
anyone that's ever struggled with girlfriends, right? I lost, I would say three of them because I wasn't masculine enough. Mm. 100%. I forced them into their masculine. Which, if you don't know much about that, I'll let Lockie explain in a second. But essentially, put it this way. If a woman's with a, a man or a girl's with a boy and you can't sit there and make a decision on something, she's going to have this little bit of trust issue with you that you can't, you can't be the one to lead. You can't make the decision. You can't take it where she needs to be. You can't protect. Mm. Well, it's like unconsciously, right? Like our perception of love is formed from the people we did or we didn't receive it from. So the way, yeah. So the so way they brought up through that, yeah. Like in an essence, for a, for a young woman, she learns, she learns what it's like to be loved by a man and the first person she learns that from is her father. Yep. And so if her father treated her in a certain way, despite whether or not the love is toxic, she'll, she'll unconsciously look for that same love because that, in her model of the world, is her perception of love. Sorry, yeah, that's, that's what I meant in a general statement. You've worded it way more beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, yeah, like she's taught that way by, yeah, just exactly what he said. But essentially I found out very quickly mm. that there was a reason why I was the common denominator, 100%. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of men that just won't accept that as well. Um, nice guys don't win. No. Nah, nice it, guys don't win. You hear it's, you know, the nice guys finish last and all sort of stuff. It's it's true. From what I've seen, from my experience, it's that as soon as I tapped into my masculine and started to sit, you know, barriers, sit, say that, say what I want, take what I want. Without being a prick. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be an arsehole to be a good guy that's masculine. Um, but I just started making decisions and taking what I wanted. Yeah. You know, asking for what I wanted without yeah. hurting people blatantly. So it's like, and sure enough, I've found an incredible woman that, you know, been seeing each other for a little while now and I can just see the difference, bro, in the, mm. <laughs> in the relationship. There's no... And I don't get jealous. Jealousy used to be a huge thing for me years ago. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stand it. That, Feel that. Right? Yeah. So it's like, and I know most men will struggle with that. They see their their beautiful woman, at a, they're, out, they're out at a club or something, whatever, at an event. And they see him over there talking to that really good looking dude. Boom, all these insecurities start coming up. Potentially it's a guy that looks like a guy that, they, that maybe someone cheated on with them before. So all these insecurities start coming up. It's also this, like you'll call in someone that will match you. And so if you haven't like done the work on yourself, right, then there's a good to fair chance you're going to call in someone that will mirror, will mirror you and will reflect back at you all your own insecurities. So like really if you're an integrated man, are you going to attract someone that would probably cheat on you? Yeah. No. The integrated man would see it a mile away. Yeah. And so there's no, like, he wouldn't go near that woman. Those red flags, as you may say. Yeah, uh, those red flags in a way. But it's also that, like, he has has that high expectation of the life he's living and his mission, his purpose. And he's not going to put a woman first for that, you know, he wants someone that adds all that value to his life. You know, this whole idea that there's two souls come together or two half souls come together to make one. Like, no, it's like 100 and 100 has to equal 200. And it's just adding that can increased value. Um, there's a quote I shared today, which I'll read out, which is about um, around this. So the narrative of where are all the awakened men, you know, this narrative, right? It's a great way to avoid doing the deeper work of becoming a vibrational match for a man who is truly embodies, who embodies the awakened masculinity, right? Oof. Often what lies beneath feeding into this narrative is an unconscious fear of actually meeting an awakened man. His energy is as clear as an ancient sword. He is not a project. He honors the feminine but does not put her on a pedestal. No one can control him. He speaks and live, lives his truth relentlessly. An awakened woman does not feed this narrative as she knows it will only drain her power and lead to the closure of her heart. I love this guy, Lorin Kren. He uh, puts out something 
incredible content. That's the guy, guy that quoted it? Yeah, Lauren Crenn. Dude, that is epic. That makes so much sense too. Yeah. He, I love uh, how they're just calling out saying, where are all the men, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, we do the work and that man will come to you. Yeah, from from that perspective. Vibrationally, you know, the frequencies, as we are talking about before, it's like, mm. again, I'll say it again. I've said it on fuck, like six of my last podcasts. The frequency, your frequency is what you'll frequently see. So sure enough, people have asked me like, oh, everything's just going rough for you. I'm like, yeah, it is because I'm on that level. I'm doing the work. I'm surrounding myself with good people. That's why the opportunities are coming to me. Yeah. I'm also seeing nothing but good in the world. You know, I could sit here and say there's heaps of bad shit happening because there is. Mm. There's some horrible things happening to our world, man. Like government-wise, restrictions, laws, all this bullshit that's going on. Yeah. Financial crisis. Financial, <laughs> man. There's a there's a massive financial cris- crisis happening right now. Yeah. And yet people aren't even seeing how bad it's going to get. Yeah. And yet... I'm not focusing on that. I want to bring light to it. Obviously, I want to help people through this because it's horrible. And I know some people are going to struggle because obviously we're at a good state mentally, physically, yeah. environmentally. But what about the poor buggers that aren't? We'd love to bring them up so that they're ready, mm. foundationally ready for this shit that's coming mm. or is already here mm. because it's going to get worse. Yeah. That's not just being facetious. Like, guys, it is going to get so much worse. So if we can... Just do the work now, prepare ourselves for it, move through it. Because, I mean, everyone's whinging about how expensive petrol is. But if that's what you're focusing on right now, there's bigger issues there. Mm. You know, prices are rising on everything. Mm. So when are you going to do the work to realize that you can elevate with that? It's, and this whole thing of either being a cause or effect, like you can say, oh, shit, petrol prices are rising I'm working all these hours. I'm going to cut blah, back blah. on this, this, and this. The boss, I'm like, well, why don't you make more money? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, they go, what do you mean? I'm like, what, what's it's not that you? easy. Yeah, what do you, what's stopping you from making more money? What, why haven't you asked for the pay rise? Why haven't you started a side hustle? What aren't you doing? We live, we live in the most resource abundant time in the history of the world. If you want to learn something, Google it, YouTube it, right? It's not that fucking hard. It's the fact that most people are lazy and are scared. You know? And if you need us to hold your hand, we will. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a rough thing to say, but like I did a reel last night and it was on the, it was, you can blame, you can blame the world, you can blame your parents, you can blame the environment, you can, you can just blame. But, but blaming doesn't change where you're standing. You can, you can be standing in shit and you can try and look up at the sun and try and smell the daisies, it doesn't stop the fact that you're standing in shit, <laughs> right? So keep blaming. Like, I know there's a lot of people that love to blame the world. I'm like, well, that's nice, man. I'll see you in 10 years' time when I'm over here and you're still f- blaming. It's a choice. It doesn't get you anywhere. It just might make you feel a little bit better and justify to yourself and tell yourself the story that, oh, where I am is okay, you know? despite you complaining about it consistently. <laughs> mm. like. Literally, you're just going to sit there and complain or do something about it. And that's where you would say that would be when you're stepping into your masculine, hey? You're going to um, get shit done. You're going to do things and like move forward, make the changes that need to be made, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think for men and women, it's more just accountability. Mm. And I... I, I it might be more masculine, it might be more feminine, but it's that sense of ownership for yourself. Yeah, have some respect for yourself. Yeah. What did you say the other day that we tried to bring up again? It was like, people don't value themselves enough to see the value in what they do or something like that. Yeah, it was It was something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was almost like they won't go do a self-development course or something mm. because they don't think they're worth it. Well, it's the, this is the... Um, I've got one of the things here is that the first law of growth... It's that people will not rise above their own opinion of themselves. So it's like, I don't expect someone to invest $3,500 in a coaching program if they don't think they're worth $3,500, if they don't value their future at $3,500, right? At the end of the day, three and a half k is not that much, all right? No. Even if you're on minimum wage, you know, it's not that much. You can make it work. You can make it work. I've made it work. (laughs) Exactly. I've I've been scraping by for 12 months now, bro, like doing my businesses. I'm a startup. You know, I was going to op shops and reselling on eBay to make money. You know, like just 
However I could to get by, I did it. Mm. And I'm at this point now where I'm about to potentially start making some serious money, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah, It's, it's not what I'm in this for at all, by any means. If anyone's listening to me, like, oh, man, are you fucking doing this for this? Like, no. <laughs> uh-huh. I just realized my self-worth, man. I've created this perceived value, and now I am worth that. Mm. That's just how it is. It's how it works. There's a, there's a great quote. I referenced uh, Suits on, on the Stableman podcast two weeks ago, so I'll use a different one than I did. Uh, Lewis comes into Harvey and they're like, our backs are up against the wall. You know, what do we do? And he's like, I don't know. He's like, you've told me how to get out of this before. He's like, how? We break down the goddamn wall. (laughs) You know, if you're backed up against the wall, break it down. Someone holds a gun to your head. Same thing from Suits is there's 147 different ways that you can get around it. There's so many different ways that you can figure out a solution, you know? Mm. <laughs> That's big, dude. I think I think also as I was coming on my way down, I heard a, uh, as I always do, I listen to, I'm, I try to grow every day. I yeah. learn something new. It's just something new. And I get it. Not everyone's in that space because they're worried about just surviving, Yeah, which is fair. I get that. So many people are in that space. I was there. But I heard her say, it was like people don't even have a chance to think about these things because they can't be conscious because they're they're in a state of constant fear, right? Yeah. Which I get. But what for? What if for a second you just had that moment where you woke up out of the matrix, as you may call it, you have that awakening. Mm. My awakening happened during a really horrible time. Mm. Tam's got locked out of the country in 2020. Mm. A lot of people awakened during that because they had time. They had to slow down. They had to stop. They had to think. Yeah. Be with themselves isolation right mm. it caused a lot of awakenings look at where we're at two years later yeah. and it's only just getting started so take that awakening as a choice and an opportunity to change because there's a reason you're starting to see things for what they are yeah question everything i mean you don't have to i'm not going to sit here and tell anyone to do anything yeah but just know that you're listening to this conversation and thinking i want to be where these dudes are at mm it's very doable. It's not impossible by any means. Mm. You do a bit of hard work. You deal with some emotions that come up. Do a few breath works, DMT releases, <laughs> stuff like that. It's good fun. You mm. scream a bit. Scream a bit, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, you can have whatever you want. You just got to make that decision. Mm. So I think, you know, coming back to a storyline, and we've smashed this out already, the rewire your shadow program, right? Eight weeks. Mm. We've got these guys for eight weeks. Every day they've got access to us. There's even a fucking retreat during it. Mm. Can we speak a little bit about what's going to happen on that retreat? Because I think, honestly, I would invest in this program purely because yeah. of the retreat Being itself. Part of that retreat. Let me read you all a, a part of this. For anyone listening, it's on the Sunshine Coast. So we're going to do it probably halfway through. Yep. So about the round about the fourth or fifth week. So, people will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own souls. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. That retreat is about making your darkness conscious. It's about making you aware of how these deep, dark, repressed things are creating the world you're living in. And there's a number of things we'll do around helping you see that. But you'll be out of your comfort zone. That's for goddamn sure. Because if we didn't push you, then you wouldn't be growing. We're taking you to the edge so you can nourish your centre. I love that. For, for an example, if anyone really wants to know if this shit works, go speak to Rose Hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, Rose, in the last two months or so, she's worked be- with both myself and Lockie. Um, her life has changed. Mm. I don't even know if I can mention her name <laughs> through that sort of stuff, but um, I'll ask her before I release this. But, dude... The work she's done, she's been doing work, mm. right? That's the thing. She's been doing the work, but she, nothing had really stuck and hit. 
And then, especially when you came into the fold and really took it deep into the shadow stuff, just night and day, bro. To see her posting videos of herself um, singing on Instagram again, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. So, look, guys, the evidence is there. We've both helped people change their lives. I did my first program. I didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> I still helped people change their lives within five weeks. So, imagine what we could do together especially with Lockie's abilities and in eight weeks, just knowing that we know there's so many people out there listening yeah. that want the changes. Yeah. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Henry Ford. Love that. Indeed. So it's whether you guys are ready to make a change. If it's with us, awesome. If it's... Yeah, if it's with a, someone else. To, you know, we're not... <laughs> This is the big thing to remember is that I know myself, I won't speak for Lockie, but I know myself that I'm here for a reason. It's a big reason. I'm here to be a healer, to help in some way. I went through the shit I went through to be able to resonate with pretty much any human on this planet. Mm. I've been through some dark times. I've nearly killed myself. I've been in severe depression. I've not known my purpose. I've all those things, self-worth, whatever, relationship issues. Name every single fucking thing that you could think of. I've been through it. But I've faced all those now too. But there's still more to come. There's always more to come. I want to be doing this until I die. Oh, yeah. I just want to be getting better and better, you know? And I want to... I'd love to one day work with people like Jordan Peterson. Mm. I'd love to be able to spend $200,000 or whatever he's cost. Or whatever. I don't even know if he works with people. I don't know. But, you know, there's always ways we can get better and better. Mm. So if I can get better and better to help people... More and more than perfect. And I'm sure you're the same. Yeah. I'm just thinking about some resources I can give right now. I was going to say, because I love to finish off with like a best tools, tips and tactics that you've used or what you can recommend. Because we always want to give value no matter what. Mm. Even if no one wants to work with us, we still want to give the value and the opportunity for them to grow themselves. Yeah. Uh, so free resources, I would find a women's circle or a men's circle in your area. Uh, I'd listen to the Resilience Project. Um for men, uh, I and John is probably one of my favourite. Oh, you sent me that, hey? I still yeah, need to listen to that. I think it's better than The Way of the Superior Man and everyone loves The Way of the Superior Man. I was about to say it. <laughs> um, for women, uh, there's one called Running Running with the Wolves, I believe it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, then, like, if you're ready to invest in yourself, I'd say go do NLP with, um, with Elizabeth Ann Walker. She is amazing. Um, yeah, f- find someone that's done the work themselves, that's integrated, you know, that's experienced life, right? That's the biggest thing, you know. And you know, just start going and doing things. Start going and doing things. Go do something. Go out for a hike. Go spend a couple of days alone in the bush. I know I have. Some of the best self-development I've done is running out of food and water and walking for 50 kilometres with a backpack on my back. (laughs) Hectic. Like, you learn about yourself in those situations, I'll tell you that much. Put yourself out of your comfort zone. Visit that edge to nourish that centre. You've got so many opportunities in this world. It's just a matter of whether or not you choose to take it. Mm, Love that, brother. We've killed that. Hour and 23 already. Felt like that went for about 10 minutes. <laughs> but I'm sure people are going to get plenty of value from that. If you do, guys, no, I know you will, feel free to share that. Send it to a friend. Um, yeah. Rate, review the show. As I say every time, this could be the greatest podcast ever, but if no one knows about it, then no one's going to get the help. Mm. So um, there's some other awesome podcasts like myself, you know, The Stable Man. They're doing some incredible things. Mental health experience on the coast. You know, I always gas up everyone else because I know that when you're on the mission, there's no competition. You know, I'll never sit here and bag anyone for the shit they do because I know what I do and I, I bring something different all the time. So no matter what, as many coaches or podcasts or whatever pop up, awesome, more the merrier because yep. there's more people that need help yep. every day, every day. So yeah, guys, help us get it out there. Um, this program is starting on the 4th of July. So there's a few weeks left. We'll be doing a few more lives and stuff leading up to that. Um, if you want to work with Lockie as well, I'll drop his uh, stuff in the show notes. We've got, you, we've got time over this next week uh, for whenever this is released. Um, 
I'll probably drop it. I'll probably drop it ASAP, hey? Yeah, cool. I reckon, I reckon just drop it like tomorrow. Just yeah, get it out. Get it out there to everyone because obviously Merv's podcast dropped today, which is a great podcast. Um, so yeah. if we drop two in one week, cool. Yeah, sick. Um, um, yeah, send us a message. Let's jump on a call. Let's actually have a chat. Because a big part of this program is the application is like I want to make sure that this is right for you. I'm not I'm not just taking anybody. I want people that are committed. I want people that are ready for this next step in their life. Uh, so send me a message, send Trav a message. Let's jump on a call and actually have a chat. And on the podcast, I challenge you to go send this podcast to three people that you know would really benefit from having a listen to what Trav and I have talked about today. Because, you know, it can be that one friend that sends you that link that you open up that changes your goddamn life. So send us a message, have a chat, even if even if this isn't for you, but you're just curious. I was still, gonna say, yeah, still send guys, us a message. Just understand that all these like free resources, the coaching groups, the master classes, the calls, whatever, it's not us trying to lure you into anything. Literally. It's, it's making change. It's just making change. Maybe maybe we have a chat for an hour, you get something from it, cool, and you move on. I am not, for myself especially, going to try to drag you into something that you're not ready for or you don't want to do. It's not what it's about. But we also understand the people wanting those calls. Yeah. Usually there's something deep down inside you knowing that there's time for change. Something that I think people should know about me as well is that I hold individuals to their highest projection. And this is something that Tyler Erickson, one of my mentors, said to me. Shout out Tyler. Tyler, yeah. You know, he holds people to their highest projection. That's something I've taken on. If I push you, especially on a call, to sign up, right, a big reason is because I know what you're capable of. I might only have had a 10-minute conversation with you, but I know what's possible because I've seen what's possible time and time again, right? Anything is possible. I believe that. It's just that right now, maybe you can't see it yet. But I wonder what would happen if you were to just commit and take the step. Sometimes if you want to take the island, you've got to burn the boats. One of my favourite quotes. Mm. Yeah, we'll finish on that. That was awesome. Thank you, brother. Well, good. Appreciate you. And excited pleasure. for this this program. Um, and excited for everyone listening to this because I know every single one of you would have gotten a lot from this. And feel free to message us and let us know what you did get from it. And we'll have that call. Mm. Amazing. Exciting. Thank you, my man. Love and it. thanks, guys.